Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment or two. We'll let folks join and then we'll kick it off. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining. Welcome to the inaugural Britability Week 2020. Um, it's been a fantastic week so far of lots of social media. We had a great panel discussion last night. And today we have another great presentation for you. Um, so we have Virginia Rose here and uh, she, will present, she will be presenting Britability Access for Everybody. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. The chat is open for your questions. So please feel free to throw your questions in the chat. We will um, have a Q&A portion towards the end of the, uh, of the webinar. This is also uh, streaming live on Facebook. So there will be, um, if you're on Facebook, throw some comments under the video there. Let us know how you're feeling. Ask any questions there. We will bring them over here to the Zoom and, and have them answered for you. And um, these, uh, this is also being recorded. So if you signed up and registered for this event, uh, we will send you the recording and it will also um, live on our on uh, National Audubon Society's um, uh, Facebook page. So you'll be able to access the uh, video there. And so those are the housekeeping items. And now I just wanna introduce um, Virginia Rose. The, uh, Virginia is phen a phenomenal birder. Um, she's been, a, she's a paraplegic of 47 years and the founder of Birdability. And she, you know, believes that being outside in nature and birding has really challenged her, empowered her, and provided her with some of the greatest happiness of her life. And uh, one of her best, one of her favorite quotes is, my best self was waiting there all along, which I find extremely inspire inspiring. Um, her mission is to help others with mobility challenges experience it for themselves. And her motto is, you won't know until you go. So, I mean, Virginia has just been an inspiration for me in creating the Abertability Affinity Group and for all who want to ensure that birding and nature is accessible for everyone. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Virginia. Hello, and thank you, Devon. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Thank you to National Audubon for the encouragement and support from the very beginning, way, way back in April 2018, to this wonderful Birdability Week of 2020. And thank you all for Zooming and for your enthusiastic participation. Click. The presentation today will focus primarily on mobility challenges. But in the last year, Birdability has recognized other specific access challenges, visual impairment, autism, mental illnesses or other health concerns, stay tuned. I wanna to begin today with a question. When we say the mobility challenged, who do we mean? People who use wheelchairs or scooters or canes or other devices, of course, but I'm asking us to look further. Aren't we also talking about people with grumpy joints and aging parents or young children? And aren't we also talking about people who no longer want to worry about keeping up? 
let's remember that in 10 or 20 or 30 years, each of us is going to want to continue birding. Let's not think of the mobility challenge as other. Our audience includes our future selves. My grandmother birded into her 90s. My mom is still birding at 84. Let's keep that in mind as we discuss the importance of accessible trails for everybody. Let's talk about the objectives. Click, go back one, Dan. Let's talk about my objectives today. Participants will learn about birdability, the philosophy, the steps I've taken, and the steps they can take to make birding more inclusive for those with accessibility challenges. My mission is to show others with accessibility challenges the benefits of birding, the possibilities, the learning, the successes, and the beauty. And in so doing, share a greater sense of freedom, community, and joy. I guess first on the agenda is to try to define accessibility challenges. That's difficult. They describe the difficulties someone experiences using the physical or social environment to engage in a meaningful activity. Birdability is focused on removing accessibility challenges affecting birders with a disability, which may be a result of mobility challenge, vision impairment, autism, mental illness, or other health concerns, as I mentioned a moment ago. Often, it's the environment that is disabling, rather than the person who is disabled. Learn more about accessibility challenges for birders with disabilities and what you can do to help at audubon.org slash birdability. Let's talk about the ADA and understand that for entities to meet compliance asks only the bare minimum. ADA compliant does not equal accessible or ideal for all potential users. I was injured in a horseback riding accident in 1973 when I was 14 years old. I began birding 17 years ago when I was 44. In 2003, I was a high school English teacher in Austin, Texas, when I heard about a birding program that would be held in my neighborhood that evening sponsored by Travis Audubon. I attended that program and was hooked. Before I made it even home that evening, I called my mother and I said, mom, why didn't you tell me I was a nerd? My life would have been so much easier. I immediately joined Travis Audubon and signed up for every class and field trip. I met wonderful people along the way who encouraged me to go and do whatever I could. At no time did a Travis Audubon leader tell me no. My new walking birding companions just followed my lead and I am to this day very proud of them and very grateful. One leader, Cliff Shackelford, did not skip a beat when the group encountered a tall set of steps to a rookery. He looked up at, I looked up at him, he looked down at me, he swung his binoculars onto his back, picked me up and said over his shoulder to the next guy, get her chair, dude. And off we went, no questions asked. Another leader, Jeff Patterson has for 10 plus years been my right hand birding man spotting me over roots and rocks and rutted roads, sandy beaches and in and out of trucks and golf carts, identifying birdsong all the while. On an East Texas trip, Travis Audubon leaders Sheila Hargis and Lori Foss deftly lifted my wheelchair and all over a huge tree across our path on our way to the Swainson's Warbler. And finally, Dr. Byron Stone, AKA Dr. Birdie, out bushwhacking in a central Texas field with my fellow sparrow classmates, encircled a Leconte sparrow and carefully delivered it all the way to me. I was sitting in my chair on a dirt road, unable to join them in the field. The lifer landed six feet away from me on a barbed wire fence, giving me great looks. I gave him great looks too. Next slide. I soon realized that birding in a chair has added benefits. At the end of the birding day, 
I do not just come home with a list of birds. I come home with a very real feeling of accomplishment and pride. I come home empowered. Let me tell you why. Next. Committing to a trip, not knowing if I can do it, is scary. Not knowing in advance the obstacles I will face is hard. Making sure not to impose on the itinerary or others experience is of paramount importance to me. Each trip requires me to figure some things out. Let me share some situations with you, which in retrospect are usually hilarious. Parking. I use a van with a ramp requiring eight foot passenger side clearance. I cannot tell you how many times I have parked, transferred into my wheelchair, only to realize that my ramp is heading off a cliff into a fence or a giant rosemary bush. Sometimes I go for it and sometimes I start over. And then there are those hazardous roadside birders. You know who you are. Try getting out on the side of a road with a ramp. One side offers traffic, the other deep grassy ditches. And by the time I figure all that out, birders are shouldering their scopes and heading back to their cars. The restrooms that are available are not often accessible. All day long, I am navigating curbs and fences and gates cattle guards. Just think about that one for a minute. Dan, where are the cattle guards? There they are. I want everybody to think about that one for a minute. Yes, I can do cattle guards, but I don't know anyone else in a wheelchair who can or would do such a stupid thing. And then cow patties, for heaven's sakes, chasing mountain plovers. Once I realized I was wheeling over 50 yards of pasture each time, navigating around cow patties, I stopped and I thought, wait a minute here. What am I doing? Also, cow patties on your shoes is one thing. Cow patties in your hands is quite another. Then there's the dreaded gravel, rocks, and roots. Cactus thorns and flat tires. Not kidding on that. Mud and sand. And the well-meaning but completely ineffective efforts to make something accessible. Think boardwalks. Boardwalks with floorboards placed more than an inch apart. Scary for skinny front wheels. Boardwalks with railings placed perfectly to obstruct my view. Boardwalks with steep grades that would land me in the creek if it weren't for the railings obstructing my view. And of course, maintaining my independence throughout is imperative. Next. But I am not complaining. My life's philosophy, difficulty and uncertainty lead to empowerment and joy. It is the main message to people with mobility challenges who do not yet know they are birders. And it is also the message to everybody else. Next. The more birding I did, the more I expanded and understood my own abilities, physical and otherwise. Birding has brought me a serious and joyful purpose, complete with a community willing to include me on every level. And with all that, a level of confidence, a solid sense of self and a happiness I'd never known. I became convinced that the best we can be is waiting for us in nature. Next. Look at all these joys, the learning, the friendships, the birding sites, the physical health, the confidence, the independence, the community, the purpose, and the birds. All that equals empowerment with a capital E. Next, can you, oops, go back one, Dan. Can you see why birding can be so integral for people with mobility challenges? And wait, for everybody? 
In the intervening years, I led monthly beginning walks for seven years, compiled a list of 30 plus accessible parks in the Austin area, retired from a teaching career of 28 years, and joined the Travis Audubon Board of Directors. Next. Two years ago, I decided to do my own birdathon, my own darn birdathon, thank you, and named it Birdability. Click. What we may be hearing or not hearing is the soundtrack from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Click. I would bird from dawn to dusk. Click. In five accessible parks and see as many birds as I could see. Next. I determined to go alone because I wanted to make the point that these experiences can be done independently and unattended. The paper did a feature, the local TV station did a feature, the National Audubon in New York City contacted me and asked if a photojournalist could fly down to Austin and follow me on my birdathon. It was a wild and wonderful day. Next. Next. I birded for 12 hours in five parks. Next. I wheeled at least 10 miles. Next. And saw 52 species with two journalists in tow, one of whom was local and one of whom was the renowned Mike Fernandez of National Audubon, who so beautifully captured the spirit of birdability in his resulting video. Thank you, Mike. I also like to think that I would have seen more birds if I weren't so busy entertaining journalists. Next. Since that day, I've been hard at work turning birdability into a real initiative. Next. I began my blog, birdability.com, after Googling what is a blog. Next. I updated the accessible Austin birding list. Next. I identified local groups whose members have mobility challenges, and I came up with a list. The spinal cord injury group, the multiple sclerosis group, the stroke and amputee groups, Easter seals, and the Austin adaptive sports group. I met with the facilitators and members of those groups and presented birdability to recruit people who didn't know they were birders yet. Next. I started monthly birdability outings. Next. And Travis Audubon added birdability to his website and calendar. Next. This is the first ever birdability outing in Austin, May 2018. I only got one taker for that first walk. And I have to say, I was very confused. Where were, where were all the birders? I don't understand. What's wrong with these people? And my friends simply smiled and said, Virginia, not all people in wheelchairs are itching to get out and go birding. What? Click. 18 months later, we have what my Australian birdability admiral says is a respectable birding party. I have to admit, some walking people without mobility challenges are infiltrating the birdability outings. I take extraordinary pleasure in yelling, no walking people allowed. We all get a good laugh, but also it's a poignant reminder that birding should be for everybody. Next, a loud shout out to Mary Gustafson, the chair of the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival in Texas. Mary had the foresight over three years ago to bring mobility challenged birders into her festival. The Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival is one of the first, if not the first, birding festival in the country to offer mobility challenged events. The leader of those particular events, Lori Foss of Travis Audubon in Austin, brought me in as a leader in training two years ago. The next year, I received an invitation to handle those events on my own. Surrounded by amazing international bird guides, who've been leading for decades is intimidating. I just keep telling myself, no one can bird in a wheelchair like I can. And then I added birding festivals to my plan. 
In terms of festivals and accessibility, we have some work to do. In many cases, terrain and topography just makes it impossible. And it's often difficult to keep a wild spot wild and accessible. I appreciate that challenge, but in some situations, a mobility challenge birder can follow the inaccessible vans to a birding site and perhaps bird just a portion of that site. In Austin, I know the Golden Chief Ward is in the parking lot of an otherwise completely inaccessible site. I think officials will be surprised at the possibilities, and I think the mobility challenge birder will be surprised. Will the festival schedule and the birding sites be perfect? Probably not, but I know we can do more than people think we can do, and often we can do more than we think we can do. My motto, you won't know until you go. Next, no one can predict what an individual with an accessibility challenge can or cannot do. That person won't know either until she or he goes. And that's the whole point. And so emerged Vertibility, a nationwide plan. First, Find folks with mobility challenges in Audubon chapters. I knew if there was Virginia Rose with Travis Audubon in Austin, Texas, that there were others. Second, find accessible birding sites. Third, find people with mobility challenges through various support groups, as I mentioned a moment ago. Introduce them to birding and organize monthly outings. Next. Find the most accessible birding festivals and schedule accessible events. Next, get birdability programming at kids disabled camps. Next, get birdability programming at rehabilitation facilities. I wanna to speak to this for a moment. Um, there is a wonderful organization in Austin called Rehab Without Walls and it's an innovative approach physical and occupational therapy. It's taking the therapy out of the gym and onto the most meaningful places for clients. So for instance, when I was doing some physical therapy, all of my therapy was done on a birding trail. I realized the potential there immediately and I did a presentation to a room full of 50 therapists, all of whom jumped on board. And I've been leading quarterly walks for Rehab Without Walls ever since. Next, get birding stations established at assisted living centers. I was able to do that a few months ago here in Austin when one of the residents reached out and asked, can't we see birds here? So we set up a birding station with two squirrel proof feeders, a water feature, benches, and some loaner binoculars to be checked out at the activities desk. It's very popular. Next, get centers for independent living participating in birding field trips. Once the activity director at these living centers knows that there are accessible parks, we can set up quarterly field trips for seniors. Next, and of course, actively include veterans in as many different bird outings as possible. Next, Ahoy, birdability captains. We all have just seen how many, how many things there are to do and how, many, how much work there is to do. And for some reason, when I started this idea two years ago and people were reaching out to me, I insisted on talking to every one of them and we would get on the phone and talk for hours. I enlisted every one of those per persons who reached out to me as a birdability captain, no one said no. Today, we have 18 captains representing 13 states and Toronto. Thank you, Andreas Jimenez at Birds Canada. We have Alabama, Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Maryland, Mississippi, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Washington. Is your state represented? All right. Then I was invited 
in the summer of 2019 to conduct a workshop at the National Audubon Society Convention in Milwaukee. Of the many things I wanted to communicate, two were most important. First, who is the mobility challenged person really? And second, what does an accessible park really look like? To that end, I created a handout entitled Access Considerations. What is accessible? Good question. And we tried to define it at the beginning of this presentation. But I realized early on that if I attempted to identify a place as ADA accessible for everyone, I wouldn't get very far. So I made a list of access considerations that I understood. They are those that list is fairly general and certainly does not claim to be officially ADA certified. As I said earlier, the person with a mobility challenge will have to visit the park to determine for sure if he or she can manage it. But a very important point here is that ADA regulations were meant to liberate us. A strict adherence to them limits us. Let's talk about zero steps. So many people say there's only one small step. That said, generally, one small step may be manageable for a manual chair, but only with help from walking people at times. Next, the length of the trail. Ideally, 0.5 to 200 miles. Oh, my editor took out the 200. She said two miles was more reasonable. Fine. Number three, parking, of course, includes a van space with an eight foot area for, for the vehicle ramp. Hopefully, the parking lot is not on a slope or filled with potholes. And for those of you driving van, van, driving vans, if there are no van spots, park across two spaces and use a cone to block the area next to the ramp space. And by the way, more specific details exist on a guidance document entitled Access Considerations that we're working on currently. Next, the ramp slope and the trail slope. For example, on a ramp, if you are managing a one inch vertical rise, you need 12 inches to approach it. These slopes are ideal, but fairly rare. And people with mobility challenges often encounter difficult slopes and are able to manage. Next, surface. Trail surfaces can make it or break it. Many birding sites with hard packed dirt pads work wonderfully. And those are my favorite, until it rains. Crushed granite paths are OK, depending on how hard packed they are. I myself am continuing to learn that the more stabilizer is added to the crushed granite, the harder the path can become. Gravel, sand, thick grass, and ruts make access impossible. No obstacles rocks and roots and gates and ballads. Ballads is not a cuss word. And it must be, it must be pronounced with an Australian accent. And just so you know, a ballad is a short upright post designed to restrict passage for motorized vehicles. But ballads can also obstruct people in wheelchairs. Number seven. Railings on boardwalks or bridges should be placed to optimize, not obstruct, the eye line of a seated person. My eye line is at three feet, so the railing needs to be below that, ideally at two to two and a half feet, or is in some other way constructed to allow viewing for seated persons. Bird blinds are accessible. Make sure the entrance is a minimum of 32 inches. Make sure that the windows are low enough for a seated person to see and make sure that the benches inside are movable and lightweight. And I might just add that if we can get the photographers to make room in the front row, that's always wildly appreciated. Thank you, photographers. We love you. Number nine, 
Benches need to be available, ideally every eighth of a mile. And next, bathrooms. I have a lot of details about bathrooms. We've already, already established that the width of the door needs to be 32 inches minimum. But if the door is too heavy or awkward, or if there's not ample space around the opening of the door, I won't be able to get in. If the stall size, if the stall size is 60 by 60, that'd be great, but not all people in wheelchairs need that much space. The, the accessible sink and faucets need to be something that people can manage. I seldom find a sink that is accessible and that the faucets are ones I can use. And of course, I always appreciate a well-placed mirror. 11, this site is accessible by public transport. And I have to make a confession on this one. When I was early on trying to help people in wheelchairs get to my event, their first question was, is it on public transport? Is it on public transport? And I, my jaw dropped. I had no idea. I had not even anticipated that question because I'm talking from a point of privilege. I have driven my own adapted vehicle for 45 years. I came home, immediately started calling the public transportation company in Austin, and they had no idea what parks their bus routes um, we're near. So that's a whole nother task. Whole nother. Number 12, ample shade available during the warmest months. So for instance, in Austin, we tried to go to the Botanical Center, which is beautifully shady, in especially in June and in September. 13, there's accessible signage with features that are gonna be accessible for everybody. Signage with information on the key features above. Next, we need staff and volunteers at the sites to be trained in the resources that are available at their own sites. Next, this is a great example of an accessible sign that could be well used by people with all kinds of different accessibility challenges. Next. And you can see that the sign includes the length of the trail, the surface of the trail, the width of the trail, the grade, and the cross slope, along with really helpful minimum and maximum percentages. Next. Minutes, just minutes after my presentation, Elizabeth Todd, a Dangerman fellow working at National Audubon in 2019, and Ryan Hobbs of National Audubon approached me about creating a GIS interactive map to identify and pin accessible birding sites. My jaw dropped. Within five months, using my Access Considerations handout, they created the map. On March 12th, Audubon launched the birdability map to Audubon chapters nationwide. Within one week, the map had 100 new accessible sites. Incredible joy. A year long road trip is in my future. Any joiners? Early in 2020, National Audubon created the birdability affinity group bringing together other underserved birder populations and facilitated by the one and only Devon Trotter. It is an amazing process watching these interests converge and blossom into all kinds of wonderful. For the separate organizations and their separate, I'm sorry, specific participants, for the various communities and their members, and finally, for the birds. Let's look at the purposes. So, the Birdability Affinity Group seeks to promote a thriving, respectful, and welcoming environment for people of all abilities at National Audubon Society, and to create a community where members can come together to discuss, mobilize, and advocate for people of all abilities. Next. Next. 
So we want to help people recognize what they can do to implement birdability locally. This list is also going to be one of the guiding documents that we are working on. And I want everyone to notice that these bullet points pretty much follow the national plan that I covered earlier. So first bullet, please refer to the access considerations document or the criteria that you will see in the birdability review at audubon.org slash birdability. Second bullet, identify potential sites by phone or website. By that, I mean, do not rely on someone's idea about whether or not a park is accessible. Don't forget to, to um, contact your county parks, your city parks, your state parks, your national parks. Each one of those parks has an accessibility director or an accessibility department. On the national parks, you can go to each park's website and select plan your visit in the site navigation. And there is an accessibility coordinator at every national park. Also make a point to call the state park accessibility office and City Parks and Recs have something called the Inclusion Unit, and the county parks also have main information, have uh, uh, call the main office for them to give you def um, information about accessible parks. Next, complete the in person birdability reviews, and those are the ones that were asked the that's to find the accessible sites in your area and add those to the birdability map. Consider including that same information on your website, such that when a person is interested in visiting your city and he or she is not able to access the birdability map for some reason, or if those local sites are not yet on the birdability map, then make sure that your website, your Audubon chapter website, has the, the accessible parks listed. Next. Collaborate with local organizations to hold monthly birdability outings like I did with spinal cord injured, multiple sclerosis, stroke groups, adaptive sports groups are all over the country. Don't forget the school for the blind. Next. And include birdability events as, par as part of your birding festival. Speaking about birding festivals, click. Identify those festivals that have the most potential for access. I'm thinking Florida, Texas, Oklahoma. I'm talking about the flattest states we can find. Once you've identified local sites that are accessible, go ahead, get that site on the schedule. Next, when possible, assign a leader with accessibility challenges to lead the event or call me. In fact, I want to I want to say something about that in the events that I have led. I've had several people with mobility challenges say how relieved they were. That was the word they used. How relieved they were to see someone leading who was also in a wheelchair. So there's that. Next. Things you can do to help birdability, add accessible birding locations in your area to the birdability map at audubon.org slash birdability. Participate in and share birdability week during October. Be sure to use the hashtag birdability week too. Encourage birders who experience accessibility challenges to complete the birdability survey found at audubon.org slash birdability. We want to know who you are and what you need so that we can provide that. Number four, watch the panel discussion and the webinar during Birdability Week and promote them to your circles. Number five, encourage your bird club or your birding leaders to hold accessible birding outings throughout the year as a regular offering. I know that whenever I identify an accessible park, I make sure and let the field trip committee know that when they post that event, that they're to use the words an accessible outing. Number six, follow Birdability on Instagram at Birdability 
and sign up for updates via the Birdability blog at audubon.org slash birdability. Next. Let me conclude this way. It's true. I am a nerd and I found my best self in birding. I want people with mobility challenges to know that they can bird, that there are accessible birding places, and that Audubon chapters all over the country are just waiting to welcome them into amazing birding communities. I want them to experience the same freedom, empowerment, and pure joy that birding has brought me. It's the greatest happiness of my life, and I want to show them how to get it. Thank you so very much for your support. Next. Please learn more and keep in touch with us via audubon.org slash birdability. And special thank yous to National Audubon's Birdability Affinity Group Events Committee of Volunteers, including Joe Watts and Birdability Week Coordinator slash Admiral Freya McGregor. National Audubon staff, including Devon Trotter, Ryan Hobbs, Abigail Crump, Alex Tomlinson, Christina Deckert, Preeti Desai, Nick Mason, Christine Lynn, Daniel Burns, and Bob Quinn, Birdability captains and the Birdability Affinity Group, and everyone who has supported this movement. And finally, I want special thanks to go to Elizabeth Todd of ESRI, who continues to support birdability in extraordinary ways. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Virginia. That was fantastic. Oh, good. I'm glad. And, um, you know, as I said before, just so inspiring and just looking at the comments here in the chat and just seeing folks not really, we, we talked about this before, folks sometimes just don't think about access in this way. You know, we right. all live from our own perspectives and rarely do we ever try and step out of our own perspectives to see life from someone else's eyes and, and see life through someone else's experience. Mm -hmm. And you're able to convey that to a lot of folks. And I think it has opened up a lot of different things for folks. So thank you so much for that. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you, Devon. We have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one of them being, um, would an able-bodied person leading birding outings for those with mobility and other challenges be considered the wrong person to lead such an outing? Oh, I would hate to be so absolutist as to say something like that. Um, I think Lori Foss in the years that she led for Mary Gustafson at the Rio Grande Valley Center was a perfect person to lead those walks. Um, I think it does require a person who is birding for a different reason, perhaps. I know that when I lead uh, some birding walks for festivals that some of the people who attend my walks are much less interested in the birds and much more interested in having conversations with me and others on the trail about what it is to be in a wheelchair. So, and to me, you know, that is very important. And I love that there is another forum for people who are in wheelchairs who don't even, who don't know each other initially, but who meet in this wonderful environment and launch into these long conversations. Meanwhile, I'm trying to point out the birds and they are having these, these very wonderful deep conversations um, and creating community. So. That's something we discussed earlier as well, just how this is, it facilitates and fosters community and in a way that is beyond expectations. You know, right. You we started this in, in April of 2018. Yeah. And here we are with 30 months later and we're having a global reach. Yeah. Yeah. And to also see how the uh, birdability site 
has has blown up really and yeah we're adding all of these different these different uh these different sites onto the onto the website onto the map yeah and such yeah a short run. It's been it, it's been amazing for me. You know, I I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I was just sort of wandering into the field, and um, now every it seems like every morning I wake up, there's another spoke coming out of the hub. You know, and I mean, this is just the beginning. And when I think about all the work we have to do, like like we've got to get predictability programming in kids camps, in kids disabled summer camps. That is such a no brainer, right? I mean, I mean, not only are those camps already fitted for people who have accessibility issues, but their kids and getting binoculars in the hands of kids is, you know, numero uno. I agree. And I think, as you said, I think that's a no brainer. I mean, it's yeah. that's low for sure. Right. Um, another question that came in, uh, the DC Audubon Society would like to collaborate with Gallaudet University, which is a local uh, school for the deaf and hard of hearing here in the city. But uh, they're uncertain where to find an ASL translator who would know bird names and don't want to have to rely on someone from the school to act as an interpreter when they should be enjoying birding with everyone else. Um, and so the person was wondering if we have folks in our network who could help us find an ASL fluent birder. So in the bird ability of affinity group, we have folks of all abilities. And Virginia, um, do let's, I'm wondering how do we have some an ASL interpreter in our group? I haven't seen anyone, or you know, I haven't interacted with anyone in the group. Can you? No, that? but I know I know that um, uh, Admiral Freya has some ideas about about that. I just uh, I just read a quick chat from her. So she definitely is someone we can contact to follow up on that. So thanks for that question. Yeah. And so um, if folks have questions, they can email uh, birdability for everybody at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat. Bird, birdability for everybody at gmail.com. And it looks like Freya says there, um, we want to hear more about accessibility challenges for that deaf or hard of hearing birders that we have so we know how to break down those barriers. We have our birdability uh, survey, which is right. on the birdability website, and that will help us have an, a better idea of some of the challenges that folks are facing um, right. when they're birding. Right. Uh, is this is the plan to make Birdability Week an annual event in October, same week, or perhaps another week? Well, I did kick this off by saying this is the inaugural Birdability Week. <laughs> so, <Yes>. so <laughs> for sure. Um, as folks may, folks may not know, that October is National Disability uh, Employment Awareness Month, right. which is why um, we are highlighting uh, Birdability in October. We might not stick with the same week, but you know, who knows? But we will definitely be celebrating this again next year and years thereafter, that's for sure. Yes, I hope so. Um, someone wanted to know if this recording will be on your blog, Virginia, birdability.com. Uh, yes, we can make that happen. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Anne would like to know, Anne says she's hope, she hopes to add some sites to Eastern PA area, but often does not know how to complete site layout. Would it still be valuable? Um, often does not know how to complete the site and layout? A uh, site layout. Um, I would recommend going to the birdability map and going ahead and clicking on the submit the review. And the questions that come up are very self-explanatory and they address almost every one of the difficulties that I mentioned. And so it's really, it's really such a beautifully conceived um, instrument that Liz and Ryan came up with based on my access considerations. And we very deliberately wanted it to be something that even a person without experience with access and a person without 
um, experience in knowing about sites and all the, you know, surfaces and that anybody, anybody can complete it with a pretty, with a pretty good degree of accuracy. It's a very user-friendly website. Yes, it is. For sure. And, it, you know, any, all data matters there. We need as, we try to collect as much data as we can so that even if you don't, even if you feel that you aren't adding enough, still put it there because someone can come behind you and, and you know, add to that. Ab absolutely. And can I add just one other thing? I had a dream and my dream was that people who had mobility challenges, birders who had mobility challenges would collect into teams in cities. So I was hoping that I could find, let's say, half a dozen people with mobility challenges form a team. And I want that to be everywhere so that Austin can call Seattle and say, Seattle, we, Austin wants to come up there and visit all the accessible spots that you guys have already found. So you will host us and show us around town and then Austin will reciprocate. And so half a dozen people, birders who have mobility challenges will come down to Austin and we'll take them all around Austin town and show them the birding sites here. I just, I so love that idea, the networking possibilities, the communities, the, the richness of that experience. And we can do it now. That's true. And I'm curious of um, how, how connected are your um, birdability captains? How how is that working? Oh, it's it's just been such a wonderful thing. We had our first ever Zoom meeting, and this was Admiral Freya's idea, and so we all came together on Zoom. And I think there were eight or so of us of the of the eighteen. Eight of them were able to make it that night, and we all were like silly girls in high school talking about you know, every single funny thing and, and just talking um, to each other as if we were longtime friends. And honestly, I've known some of these people for two years. I mean, they, they contacted me early on, but we never all met together at one, at one place. We talked for an hour and a half and laughing and feeling like we'd known each other for a very long time. Such a special new community, Devon. Again, community just it, it blossoms when you have this common these these common theme of of you know that that unites you, and it just mm -hmm. happens so naturally and it grows yeah. exponentially more yeah. than. Yeah. And another thing um, I'd like to add is, I think there are a lot of people out there trying to make sure that they have purpose in their lives. You know, like they want they try to be super intentional about. You know, particularly, I think people in retirement are like, what, you know, I'm just aimless, you know, it's like, I need a purpose, I need a purpose, and people get frantic about not, not having a purpose. And so I discovered with birding, that it's a lifelong purpose. You know, you never know all there is to know. You will never, you know, when it comes to birding, you will never know all the places there are to go. I mean, it, it's something you could work on for the rest of your life and never, never be finished. And what is better than that? I mean, that's, that, that's a lifelong purpose. Yeah, lifelong that's purpose. huge. Yeah. And then, and then again, the community that grows out of that, it just yeah. adds to it. Um, a question that came up, Ann asked another question. Has anyone thought about compiling a list of bird guides willing to guide someone with a disability? I don't think we, I, we haven't done that. No. I know that, um, Freya, correct me on this, but I think the Feminist Bird Club is collecting a list of, of female bird guides. Yeah, but, that I, 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 I do know that. I can... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's, but it sounds like it might be time for us to make a, a list of guides who have mobility challenges too. Yeah, and, and not even just mobility challenges, but any kind of, um, any kind of challenge that right. know, impairs folks from accessing uh, trails or nature or birding in general. Yeah, 
Exactly. Cool idea. Yeah. Um, Chris would like to know how hard it, how hard is it to adapt to the challenges of a COVID society when on the burden trail? Um, honestly, I haven't had that much trouble with it. Um, I, although I have to tell you that the people in Texas are not very good about paying attention to the six foot <laughs> rule. And I, I, I found myself grumpy and screaming at people I did not know to, <laughs> to give me six feet. And then you know what I did, Devon? I came up with this wonderful idea of a sandwich board and I could wear a sandwich board over my wheelchair. And on the front, <laughs> on the front side, it will say, please wear your mask and give me six feet. And on the back, it could say, please wear your mask and give me six feet. Oh, and move off the sidewalk, please. <laughs> don't you love it? Brilliant. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know how hard it's going to be to wheel under a sandwich board, though. That, that, that's a challenge you might have to overcome, but it's <laughs> worth it. Maybe it's someone definitely. listening can devise something like that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Um, are there any accommodations for birders who have hearing disabilities? And... Um, I think Freya, actually, our birdability admiral, um, jumped in there and said, uh, we want to hear more about those challenges. And so um, yes. I obviously put those on into the uh, survey uh, that we have on uh, audubon.org slash birdability. But then we were also discussing last night during our panel discussion, um, a couple of options that folks um, have found uh, for those who have uh, hearing disabilities or hard of hearing, hard of hearing you know, different um, types of, of microphones and hearing aids that, um, that are useful for folks who, uh, who want to hear the bird song. Right. Let's see, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, hmm. Looks like, um, oh, what about including people who are not in wheelchairs? For example, people with walkers or with different cognitive ability? Um, well, I can speak definitely to um, walkers because um, I see those devices all the time. Like when I'm leading in the Rio Grande Valley, two or three of the my usual clients use walkers. And um, I had such an interesting conversation with a couple of them, um, mostly with their ability to use a scope. So if you're using a walker, it's more difficult to, to manage a scope. And so um, that's why I'm really interested in trying to come up with a scope that can be mounted on the walker, mm. right? And last night I was speaking to the scope that I have that adjusts directly to my wheelchair and it comes on and it comes off very easily and it's not too heavy. So it's something that you know, I can handle independently. And I think the same thing could happen for people with walkers. Yeah, I mean, you could put, you could place it right in the front on the walker. If that's where you, I mean, I feel like that would be the most convenient. I've used the walker in the past. And yeah. I, would, I feel like having the scope right there mounted on the front would be the most convenient for, for you know, looking out. Um, although, although, yeah. Yeah, it, it probably makes more sense, at least in the wheelchair, I have it on the side of my chair, but there's a really beautiful angle to the arm, to the mm -hmm. attachment that allows me to swing it in and swing it out. And so the same thing would probably be appropriate for the walker because people in wheelchairs need their laps. That's a very important space that walking people may not know about, but you don't want anything in your lap. That's important space to be left open. And the same is probably true for people on walkers. They probably have certain space that's inviolable, right? And they're going to keep that. Yeah, for sure. And, and that it, it being able to angle, I think, is uh, very important there. Yes, yes. And we have time for one last question. And I'm going to, let's see, Marsha would like to know, 
can we share any resources or for planning events for children and adults with autism and intellectual disabilities? Well, we will. We, that's our, our our aim is to be that resource for um, for uh, as vulnerability for folks with um, any kind of access issues, so that we can provide these types of resources to, for folks with not only just mobility issues but also intellectual uh, disabilities, uh, so that you know we can have this inclusive um, repository of resources that we can share with our community so that everyone can access trails and be able to bird. Yeah, it's so exciting. Yeah, we're just beginning, we're just beginning. We are. Well, Virginia, thank you again so much for everything that you have done, you thank know, you. from joining, from starting the, from starting Birdability back in 2018 up until this point and being one of the founding members of the Birdability Affinity Group here at National Audubon Society and being an inspiration, not only to me, but to birders around the world. And I really, really appreciate your friendship. Thank you, Devon. I sure appreciate your help in making it all happen. My pleasure. Thank you to everybody. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm gonna place our website down in the chat one last time so that you all can access it and we will see you out on the trail. Bye, and thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye.